I'm a huge believer that I'm a huge believer in scaling. So scaling for me is finding this unique niche and place where our uniqueness and the market's uniqueness come together. And there is a hunger and a momentum from our audience that is looking for what we are providing. And so when we hit that, the company starts gaining momentum within the audience without us working extra hard to do it. So it's the difference between us having to push really hard. If we're really hitting something that's going to scale, the scaling should be easy. And I believe a company that is scaling well, the weight on the founder should get lighter as the company scales. Welcome to Growth Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? When you think about growing your business, what comes to mind first? Well, in this episode, we're going to talk about scaling your business and we're gonna look at it from a different perspective. Our special guest today is Craig Swanson. He is a former uh, founder investor of Creative Live. He is now running an incubator of sorts and advisory to many companies that are scaling up. And today we talk about scaling your business with Craig. Now, I say it's a different take on it because we look at some of the things that are getting in the way of founders that are not scaling the way they want to. And some of it's emotional, some of it's tactical or strategic but we really look at some of those emotional factors that are getting in the way of you scaling your business. Now, when you think about your own business, your own growth, hopefully you're investing in your leadership and you're investing in the leadership of those around you. If there's any leadership gaps you have right now, some uh, friction inside of your executive leadership team, or maybe it's your middle managers or frontline managers that don't have the skill sets, I would love to sit down with you and talk about your business and have a chat about what is really missing and what you nearly need to focus on. All you have to do is go to genehammett.com, schedule your business. We'll talk about what's going on. We'll put a spotlight on some of the things so that we can get really deep and get to the core issue. That is what I'm gifted at. And I'd love to give that to you. If you're listening at this moment and you're thinking you'd really use uh, someone to talk this out with, then I'm your person. Just go to genehammett.com and schedule your call today. Now here's the interview with Craig. Craig, how are you? I am doing great. How are you doing? I'm excited to talk to you. We're going to have a great conversation about founders and you know, kind of the shifts along this journey. You've had a lot of experience working with different companies and even in some of your own companies. Tell us yeah. about your background, Craig. Well, okay. So my broad background is I worked in IT for about 25 years at the beginning of my career. Um, my second career really launched in 2010 when I uh, was the co-founder of an online education company called Creative Live. And so for the last, oh, I don't know, decade, decade plus some, I have been in the business of creating teams that build digital content to sell online courses, online digital goods, different things like that. And I've created a little incubator slash accelerator slash investor company where I basically come in and partner with young companies that are just at the cusp of transition and basically invest in them, both my time and my money and some of my team to basically help them grow big and aspirationally grow really big. And we just had one of those companies, which is a uh, photography-based education company, was actually acquired last year, about a year ago. We just, we just celebrated our one-year anniversary of that acquisition by one of the largest trade show companies in the United States. You know, I've been creating content for eight plus years with the podcast, even before that, writing. Um, content is something that a lot of businesses, I think, just still hasn't adopted yet. Why do you think they don't adopt content as a way to grow the business? You know, I, I really, I find that there's a different mindset around content creation and communication within an audience that, that some companies really embrace. But I think to really be a content organized company, you have to feel really connected to a specific audience. And it needs to be an audience in which you have some type of back and forth education basis with. So um, there's a lot of companies that serve their clients with products or different services, but they're very focused on those transactions. And I think content is a lot more about a relationship with a community. And increasingly, it's a back and forth relationship because um, content goes both ways. Content both goes out, but you also have to draw back from your community what they're responding to and what you're going to dial into. Well, I've been a big fan of Creative Live. It used to be one of my big goals to be on there. I was in the studio audience uh, with a friend of mine who did something, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, but I really appreciate what you guys did there for 
for that movement. You, you're no longer with them, is that correct? We, no, I, I was a shareholder up until the point that they were acquired by Fiverr. So, um, so they were acquired by Fiverr last year. And so now it is a completely owned entity and I am off doing my own thing. Um, but a lot of my team and a lot of people I work with, we, there's still a lot of overlapping connections with the Creative Life team that, that helped build that. I did not know they were required, uh, acquired by Fiverr. So yeah, let's dive in, Craig, to mm -hmm. the real core of this is you've been working with a lot of different early stage companies that are growing, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of dependency on the founders. There's a yeah. couple of different things that are going on that, that keep them dependent on founders. And I've seen this many times before I've, I, through my coaching, I, I talked to them and said, you know, if you are making all the decisions, if things, if you're making all the sales, if you're the critical component to your business, it's going to limit you in the sales process and they get it to some level. But why do you think some companies just don't get that? concept well so let's talk about let's talk about a founder that's also really part of the visible outside brand so so we're talking about founders that have a really large outsized personal brand that is kind of core to their business mission let's just start with the basics of a venn diagram of like of my own identity and the company identity when the company maybe shares a similar name to me when my name is on the company and when my face is part of the brand message for that company and the content I've created is really connected with that audience, it can be a very confusing space for me to start to see the company as a separate entity than myself. And, and founders that can figure out how to make that transition open up a life where they can start to build a legacy for themselves that can outlast them, where they can figure out how to have a brand and identity that outlasts them. But a lot of founders can't release the control or the identity or that image of themselves as the spokesperson for everything about the company. And it becomes really fuzzy. And then basically we really, they really lose track of whether they're talking about the company needs or their own personal needs and their own personal needs are so overlapped with what they perceive to be the company needs that it makes it really hard to hand off something that is emotionally difficult. You were telling me before we hit the recorder on, there's kind of two different kind of forces inside of companies. One's mm -hmm. the founder's emotional connection to mm -hmm. the business. And the other one is just literally letting go and trusting others. Uh, let's talk about those for just a moment. So, okay. I mean, this is, I, I, I can use myself as an example. So let, let me use my, myself as an example. I have been through, I think, five or six transitions where a company that I helped found, um, had, we've built a leadership team and that leadership team has taken the company to the next step. And I have moved to a place where I'm either just a shareholder or we, I've sold portions of my company. So it is now something that I, I helped create, but is now in someone else's hands. The very first time I went through that was a very painful experience. Um, it was very painful for me to figure out who I was when this company was working without me. And I've gone through it so many times that I think I'm immune to this. I think I've outgrown it. But on this last transition, I had this, this kind of shock of realization that I was emotionally hoping that the, the person that was coming in to take over the marketing team was going to do demonstratively worse than me. So they, what I, what I found is we were doing a, there was a year end sale for the company and this was the end of 2021 and they were absolutely crushing it. it, it the, the materials were beautiful. They were creating results that were actually passing anything that I had been involved in driving in previous years. And the emotion I should have had was joy and pride. And I will say that was there, but if I'm being really honest, there was this thread of. I don't know if it's jealousy or envy or just a desire that that my impact would have been noticed that that the lack of me would have resulted in a downturn as opposed to an upturn and on a very small scale so that was me after having done about six or seven uh transitions and where i'm actively building out those transitions if you extrapolate out a little bit farther and you're an owner whose very identity has been baked into this business and and everything that i have put out is coming from me it can be really hard to see someone else starting to shine within the company because it feels like it is an attack on my identity and for founders that I guess, haven't done the self-worth or self-work to really kind of at least look into that and acknowledge that that might be in play. I think what ends up happening is a lot of people respond with a lot of tactical responses that feel like they're trying to solve a problem that may or may not exist. And they end up slapping down people that might otherwise step up and be the leaders that they need within the company. Now, Craig just talked about the owner identity. My current business as an executive coach 
is me. I am the one trading time for money. I am the one that's serving my clients. And for a while there, that's all it was. But there's something changed. I wanted to serve at a bigger level. I wanted to make an impact. And I was willing to put my own identity to the side so that I could bring others into the mix. And I found a way to do that through leadership um, on ramp. Now, this is not a pitch for the program, but you can do the same thing with you. You can actually shift your identity. I remember too, when I started my business, my identity was really baked into who I was. And when it fell apart, I fell apart. And that's a dangerous situation. You never want to be too tied into the business, but you also want to be able to let your identity help you grow forward. So it's a little bit of a delicate balance there, but I can help you through those questions. If you have any, I've been through it uh, with clients. I've been through it myself. Love to help you. Now, let's go back to Craig and finish up the interview. So that's really the emotional side to this that that keeps us from letting go sometimes mm-hmm. or the, the anguish that we go through when that identity is feels attacked. Um, mm-hmm. what, is, what else is there, there at play there? Uh, on, on the emotional side or more on the tactical side or the other pieces? Well, you had mentioned before about the importance of letting go to your team and, and literally mm-hmm. learning to trust them more and empower them more is one of the words I use quite often. Yeah. Um, that's a necessary part for you to let go, right? Absolutely. I, 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 I don't like misquoting. I'm trying to remember who quoted this, who said this. Good judgment comes from making mistakes. Oh, I can't remember the quote, but basically it means that good judgment, good judgment keeps us from making mistakes. And the only way we get good judgment is by making mistakes. And so there are two things that play that I think are in play tactically. Whenever a leader within a company starts to empower someone below them to take on more than just a logistical role, because if you want to be a leader, I believe you need to allow people the autonomy to show their own leadership. If you just want to be a manager and tell everyone what to do, there are roles within a company for managers. But if if I want to cede the leadership of my business to a future generation of leaders, I need to give them the room to start making some mistakes or putting some of their beliefs on the line for them to prove as true or as false and to start learning from that. And the problem that I think a lot of leaders find is that if you really are going to give that reins over to somebody, if you're really going to start to pass leadership, they are going to make choices that are different from the choices I would make. And in the moment that that happens, that is going to feel like a mistake or it's going to feel wrong to me if I'm the leader that's used to having everything my way. Now, it, it might be wrong. It might be right. In general, I find I feel like it's wrong, even regardless of what the results are for the company. So I almost have to have someone in my corner to help help me work through it because I have to somewhat move past the point that it's going to feel wrong, regardless of whether it's tactically a good move by the person I'm handing over leadership or as a, as a bad move. And it's really hard for me to like hold on to what the wisdom in that is. And I think instinctively, Leaders that are focused on the short term that are not focused on letting their team grow are so protective of the next decision that they are never allowing their team to start building the mistakes, the autonomy, the leadership to be able to make future decisions and to actually grow up and grow the company and build it beyond where I may have started it. You've been dedicating a lot of the work that you do to mm-hmm. understand these smaller businesses and the cost of something bigger, and you're helping them through advisory, through investing. Uh, mm-hmm. What are the key factors of you creating a business who is there, a founder's identity is wrapped up into the business, but there is a chance for growth. What do you start working on first inside of those uh, kinds of businesses? So for me, I mean, there, there, there's an exercise I go through in the early stages where I see huge opportunity and, and also maybe unexploited opportunity. And it really is two parts. One is I really dive in and start to listen hard to what the audience is telling us. Um, and I try to get past a lot of the beliefs and stories that that the company may have already held about why people are, are, are believing things or why people are using their product or what people are getting out of it. Because there's a lot of time there are stories that we impose on our audience without really giving the audience a chance to validate or invalidate or, or to gut check. Um, and then the other thing is I really want to dig in to the founder, to the owner, to the to generally the woman that has basically put her name and voice and face into building a really large brand. And I try to work with her to parse out what is most important in her brand and what is optional. In other words, what are the negotiable parts of the brand and what are the non-negotiable parts of the brand? And in general, 
I find that it's really important to, to identify the core values, the, the things that, that absolutely we would, we would turn down millions of dollars to maintain, that we would alienate parts of our audience to maintain. The core values of what the company is about. And the other pieces, the, the non-negotiable parts, which may be fonts, colors, style, all sorts of different elements, the more we can clarify that those are optional and allow learning around that from the audience, I think that's really where the combination is, to basically know where we will not veer from and where we are very open to learning from our audience. Now, I've done a lot of conversations about core values on the com mm -hmm. this book. I mean, it mm -hmm. seems like almost every episode, it comes up. Fast growth companies tend to rely on those core values. What do you wish other founders knew about core values that they don't seem to know? So I think, well, first of all, I think a lot of people approach core values as if they're shopping for a value that they wish they had. And for me, core values are always in play within the company. They were always in play with the company. It's a matter of surfacing what is true. I'm a huge believer in mission-driven organizations. And for me, the core values are something that the audience has been attracted to all along, even if we didn't put words around it. And I think that some leaders try to build foundations for the company they wish they were or the leader they wish they were instead of the leader they are and the company they are. Um, and I find that that disconnect between reality and, and what, a, what a company is actually doing often fall, sounds false in the market and, and leads, to, leads to kind of a fundamental lack of willingness to be honest within the team. Now, Craig just talked about values for a few minutes. It's really important for you to have um, a clear set of values that your people understand and it guides your company. Now, you want to make sure that you have the right touch points of this, and we're actually writing a book about it, but let me just give you one of them. You want to make sure that you spend a lot of time when you onboard your people to explain the values and to really share with them who you are as a company and why those values are important and the stories behind it and give them context. Don't uh, skimp on this. Don't skip it. Don't kind of try to compress it. Make sure that they truly get who you are as an organization so that when the time comes, they'll remember those stories. They'll remember those, those lessons that you learn and the context behind it so that they actually can demonstrate those without you being in the room, looking over their shoulder. Values are a very important piece to this. And that's just one touch point inside of this. I've got a lot of research around this with hundreds of uh, studies and, and case studies and clients. Uh, but there are over a dozen touch points that you can use the values day in and day out. You want to make sure you understand what they are. And all you have to do is keep listening to the show. And if you have any specific questions, just reach out to me and I'll share with you my research. Just go to genehabit.com and you can connect with me right there. Now back to Craig. I want to wrap us up with something I think that I've never heard this phrase before, but you've got some core messages around mm -hmm. swelling versus scaling. And mm -hmm. you've got some thoughts on this. Share with us in just a couple of minutes what, what your thoughts are about, about this idea of swelling. I'm a huge believer that, I'm a huge believer in scaling. So scaling for me is finding this unique niche and place where our uniqueness and the market's uniqueness come together. And there is a hunger and a momentum from our audience that is looking for what we are providing. And so when we hit that, the company starts gaining momentum within the audience without us working extra hard to do it. So it's the difference between us having to push really hard. If we're really hitting something that's going to scale, the scaling should be easy. And I believe a company that is scaling well, the weight on the founder should get lighter as the company scales because it's actually moving in the direction that the market and the company wants to go. Swelling is when a company is adding on all of these extra products, extra features, extra things, um, because they're trying to be something that they're not. They're, they're trying to add on additional items. They are trying to satisfy the requests and demands of edge cases within the company. And each one of those ends up creating a greater internal legacy of knowledge that needs to be maintained, different promises to audiences, and ends up creating more friction for the company to grow as opposed to uh, as opposed to growth. And so for me, swelling is about getting bigger by just like tacking things on and the company gets heavier and heavier and heavier as we go. Whereas scaling is basically narrowing down into a truer and truer focus to where we are uniquely serving one or two very narrowly defined needs in the market and really giving everything we can to serve those. I like the take on this, uh, Craig, because this is a little bit different than what I've talked about with mm. some of my clients, but I've seen the same thing happen 
over and over again. And there's resistance in this. When you think about, you know, an company evolving and wanting to scale, there's res the resistance is typically internal, but they want to project it on everyone else. <laughs> Give us just a minute on that. And as we wrap up today. We were just having a, a company meeting about some features on our website. It is so easy to say yes to everybody's pet idea. It is so easy to, to just try everything out and let an idea become kind of a consensus build amongst many, many, many players, as opposed to holding a really clear vision of what we're trying to create and saying no to a lot of opportunities so we can focus. So yeah, I, I, I know when we have a large team, everybody is going to have their own pet projects, their own pet desires, their own unique way of learning and what they, what they see is valuable. And not everyone's going to see the same thing. And I think that one style of leadership is to try to give everyone what they want. Another style of leadership is to honor everybody's input and then select it through a process where we're saying no to most opportunities. Where and, and I think where the leader is saying no to their own opportunities, where we are narrowly focused on a mission that is so important that the mission overrides a lot of personal desires along the way. I saw this happen with one of my clients, over a hundred million dollar business. And they were looking at the projects for the, the coming year. And it was everybody wanted their pet project approved, right? Because it was their project. But I, I asked him one simple question. I said, what got you to this point of 100 million? Because we were able to focus on the right work and right projects. And I go, do you see that's where we are now? We got to keep that running as opposed to we're going to broaden and do everyone's projects. And, and it was a really helpful exercise to take him through what got us uh, to this point was being focused and we can't lose that moving forward. And the message actually played well when you delivered it with clients. So I really appreciate you being here, Craig, sharing your wisdom with us, uh, being on Growth Think Tank is a pleasure. Thank you very much. This has been great. Wow, what a great interview. We talked about scaling your business from many different perspectives, the emotional side and some of the tactical stuff, um, identities that get in the way. All of these things are factors when it comes down to scaling your business. Now, the core of my work as an executive coach is helping you deal with these things so that you actually can grow your business and you can grow your team in the, the same level. And it takes both of those things. You cannot scale your business without growing your team's ability to lead more powerfully. If you want to talk to me about what's uh, really getting in the way of your growth, all you have to do is go to genehammett.com and schedule your call. We'll chat about your business. We'll dive into it and we'll identify the things that you want to focus on and, and put a spotlight on it so that you know with clarity what you need to focus on. If you decide to work with me, that's great. But if not, we've built a relationship. Maybe you'll come back over time. I'd love to give that to you. It's just a way to get to know you. If you're listening right now, that would be the next step. Just go to genehammett.com and schedule your call. When you're thinking of growth and you're thinking of leadership, think of Growth Think Tank. As always, with courage, we'll see you next time.